Welcome to Shin Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Denny. I'm Fred. And this week in our quest to we'll watch all the shows, we root for the dinosaurs blowing up Manhattan in Shin Getter Robo vs. Neo Getter Robo. So yeah, before we get into that though, we'll um, have a little talk about what we've been doing. Obviously there was this episode should have been out a little while ago, but um, family issues come first, guys. I think that goes without saying. Also apologies for this uh, episode's t- uh, audio issues, because... My mic isn't working, Freya is roboting, and I'm sure Ian's audio will completely break at some point, because that's just how it goes. So yeah, uh, Danny, what have you been watching? I haven't really watched that much anime by myself. I've been watching some seasonal anime f- with uh, Freya, Kigeki Shoujo, Sunny Boy, and uh, Aquatope, and Outlaw Star, uh, which we may do on the podcast. And all of those have been quite good, but mostly I've been playing The Great Ace Attorney. Now that I finally have access to both of those games, I finished the first one. Took me a long time, but mostly because I deliberately try to only play like an hour a day. Because once I finish both of those games, I won't have any possible new Ace Attorney content until Ace Attorney 7 comes out, whenever that may be. Yeah, un- until Hideaki Anno comes out with Shin Ace Attorney. <laughs> I'd watch that. Uh, how about you, Fred? <laughs> I me. guess I technically played Hades since we recorded the last one, which was good. This isn't a video game podcast, so I won't talk about why I think it's a bit thematically disjointed. What about you, Ian? Uh, well, I mean, we're going to be watching something that's vaguely Gona Guy related, and I have been watching uh, all of the 1972 Cutie Honey, which is more or less exactly what I expected from it. Uh, and then the later Gainax re Cutie Honey, which was wonderfully extra. Uh, also, Tenna, but. Um, that is not related to Gonagai. <laughs> um, I'm sure it was in some way influenced by Gonagai. But yeah, I mean, I've been watching Kigeki Shoujo. It's the only thing from this season that I'm really paying attention to. Okay. So, whenever we're all cut up. <laughs> Daddy, tell us about uh, Shin vs. Neo. Well, it consists of a four-episode OVA, which was released from December 2000 until June 2001. It is the fifth entry in the uh, Get a Robo franchise, first created as a manga by Go Nagai and Ken Ishikawa in 1974. There were three anime series back in the day in the 70s and 80s, and then there were three anime OVA series from the late 90s until like the mid-2000s. This one specifically draws from the manga version of Get a Robo Go, the second manga series. Uh, the original anime adaptation of Get a Robo Go took a lot of liberties and was very different from the manga series. It was a lot more child-friendly because most Super Robot was heavily targeted at children and they kind of didn't touch on all the mature stuff in the Get Her Robo universe. Ishikawa served as the artist for most Get Her Robo manga. All of the original Get Her Robo saga, though there are a whole bunch of spin-off manga that are done by different artists as like homages and different spins on it. While he is often listed as the co-creator and Go Nagai is uh, put from page and center, which... I consider Get a Robo to be more of a Ishikawa's baby than Go Nagai. Sure. I feel like Go Nagai is just listed bigger because he is the more famous of the two. Ken Ishikawa was both Go Nagai's student and also his best friend. Go Nagai said so himself at one point. Nagai is, of course, one of the most prolific manga artists who ever worked, a pioneer. He created, among others, Devil Man, Cutie Honey, Get a Robo, Violence Jack, and Manzinger, most of which spawned long lasting franchises and and impacted the way genres evolved. Um, as, as someone quipped in a in a Discord channel recently, all anime is a Gonagai reference. <laughs> <laughs> like, Get a Robot by itself was the very first manga to introduce combining robots, uh, and can thus be considered the originator of the trope, which together with Manzinga Z, which was the first not remote piloted robot, they are the pioneers of the super robot genre. Even the famous Gainax post originated in a Get a Robo manga, and of course, it heavily, very heavily inspires Gurren Lagan. The anime was directed by Jun Kawagoe, the man who has directed every Get a Robo anime series since 1998, in addition to a bunch of other mecha series. It was a collaborative project between Dynamic Planning, Gonagai's own production company, Bandai Visual, and Brainbase, the studio behind Penguin Drum, Natsuma's Book of Friends, and Aki Khan, among others. It, actually, it had been dormant for a good 15 years until 
literally this year, uh, 2021, where it is currently receiving an adaptation of the final manga in the original Geta Robo saga, Geta Robo arc. Sadly, the original story will never be finished because Ishikawa passed away in 2006 and Geta Robo arc ended on a cliffhanger with Geta, with um, the main trio confronting Geta Robo Dragon. But yeah, that's everything I've got to say about it for now. So we should get into the summaries. Ian? Uh, okay, so there's going to be a lot of names here uh, <laughs> because there are three Getter Robo pilots from the original group who I want to call the Neo group, but that is not true. <laughs> uh, there's the three from the later group who are um, piloting the robots in the sort of present day. And then there's all the many, many side characters. So if you if there are too many names, I apologize. There's only so much I can do. Also, I'm using a teleprompter. Hopefully things will go well today. Mm. So without further ado, uh, so episode one, Go Near Getter Robo. Okay, we start in media res with New York being attacked. There's cars flying, lizards dropping bombs, and uh, the three original Getter Robo pilots, that's Ryoma, Hayato, and Musashi, are locked in a battle with the dinosaur empire led by King Goru. The dinosaurs are trying to retake the surface after having been forced into the core of the planet, in the distant past. And so far they're winning. The Geta robots are trying everything they can, but even their combined efforts is not enough. Uh, but they do notice that one of the mecha sources melt because of the Geta rays. And so Musashi uses this opportunity to blow himself up using the core of his robot. A massive explosion occurs, defeating the dinosaur empire, and boom, cut to the opening. And it's a banger, but we'll talk about that later on. So we skip five years in the future, and a new set of pilots are being trained up. One of the test pilots dies in a horrific accident, and Hayato, who's been overseeing this, has to go in search of a third pilot. It is here that we get introduced to Go, uh, one of the new pilots, who is fighting in an underground wrestling match. He wins his first match pretty easily, but the second challenger is more difficult, and it turns out that's because he is a dinosaur. A panic ensues and people try to flee the match, but not Hayato, who just continues watching with interest. After Go eventually beats the dinosaur to death, Hayato reveals that the dinosaurs are after him, quote, because of his body, end quote, and that they will keep coming after him. Outside, Go defeats a Mechasaurus, and the other two Getter pilots arrive with their robots. Hayato and Go get in the third robot, and then all the robots combine. Now, initially Hayato is piloting, but an old wound uh, opens up, and so he has to coach Go through piloting it and using all of the special uh, moves like the chain knuckle and the plasma thunder. And then, dun dun dun, revelation, King Goru is still alive. All in all, a prey action-packed first episode. We apologize for Ian's lack of knowledge about the wider Get a Robo universe and thus maybe getting things wrong. If you're a dedicated fan of Get a Robo, you're not gonna like this episode. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you're gonna you're not gonna like two thirds of two parts of this episode. Wait, two thirds? No, that doesn't make sense. You're not gonna like two thirds of this episode. You might like the other one. So, arise. Uh, episode two is arise, Texas Mac. So things are not going particularly well for the Getter team. The government arrives with soldiers to commandeer the Saotome Labs and to terminate research into Getter rays. And Go is having teething problems learning how to effectively pilot his getter and is arguing a lot with the other pilots. But the main action begins when they realize that one of their satellites is malfunctioning. They confirm it with the US and we get introduced to Jack and Mary King, the pilots of the Texas Mac. And during the call, meteors are falling on the US, destroying planes and threatening Washington DC. And so the Kings dash off to save the White House. Go, however, cannot remain like inactive. He argues that they need to go and help, and so they all scramble and head off. The Texas Mac shoots down the meteors heading for the White House, but he gets confronted by the Mechasaurus bull, who overpowers him. And can can can, can the robot be a him? I guess it is male presenting. Uh, <laughs> um, and is going for the kill when it's stopped by the tabli intervention uh, of the getters. So with Mechasaurus defeated, Texas Mac is able to shoot down the satellite, and they return to Japan to face off against another Mechasaurus that is threatening the uh, Saotomi lab. 
they take it out and we get King Goru taunting at the end again. You know, I really miss giant uh, villains appearing in the sky as silhouettes. Yeah, it's one of my favourite things. I think the first time I saw it was as a kid watching um, Thundercats, and it's just the greatest just don't thing. do it anymore. Yeah. So, if any of you are super villains, Elon Musk, please <laughs> <laughs> put your shadow on the sky. Don't actually do that. Uh, episode 3, Revive Shin Geta Robo. So, at the beginning of this episode, we learned that the Japanese government does not want to authorize Getter Ray research, and the Shin Getter, believing that the Neo Getter is sufficient to defend the country. Naturally, they're about to be proved wrong. Um, so as he returns to the Saotomi labs, uh, Hayato realizes that something isn't right, and it becomes clear that the Dino Empire has attacked. And together with Go, they fight their way through the labs, trying to find and protect Dr. Saotomi and get to the Shin Getter. However, they are chased by Dino-controlled Proto-Getters, until the other pilots, Sho and Guy, intervene with the Neo-Getter. And they deal as best as they can with the dinosaurs while Hayato and Go continue on to meet the Doctor. But the sustained attack proves too much for them, and they eventually run out of plasma energy. But fortunately, Go's determination, if you like, <laughs> to help his uh, comrades is what fires up the Shin-Getter with the Getter rays, and this radiation fries most of the dinos. Uh, leaving only one Mechasaurus. Now, with all three pilots, the Shin Getter takes it on and is so overwhelming that the Mechasaurus is reduced to attempting a suicide bombing. And so, with them roundly defeated, we get our third message from King Goru in his UFO, uh, and then he decides to blow up uh, the Nysar base. Episode 4, Discover the Limit, the Earth's Future. So the stage is set for the final confrontation with Goru, but first the Shin Getter has to take out advisor Gareri and his Mechasaurus, the Gera, which sort of resembles a jellyfish. The Shin Getter's energy attacks are all getting absorbed by the Gera, so they, they initially switch to physical attacks, but they later realize that it can actually only absorb so much energy and use this knowledge to blow it up from the inside. Meanwhile, Goru begins blowing up Tokyo's famous landmarks, it's really fun seeing them all get destroyed. And uh, Saotome, Hayato, and Ryoma start trying to evacuate the civilians on the ground. The uh, Dinosaur Empire's plan is to terraform the Earth back to the Jurassic Age, and they've got these giant bacteria pollution machines. So the Shin Getter arrives, but none of its attacks are going to have any effect on the UFO. And the beam takes out its wing. This is when Texas Max swoops in to return the favour and save them but even combined, they can't do any damage to the UFO. So a new plan is used to use Professor Shikishima's supersonic pulse gun to disrupt the UFO's shields, and then use this as an opening to board the UFO. So the Texas Mac and the Shin Getter provide a distraction. Our ground team fight their way to the bridge. They kill a bunch of dino soldiers, but Goru manages to escape. However, they can turn off the terraforming machines. And on the roof... Goru is using some mysterious rays to turn himself into a giant, and he psychically pulls the Shin Getter through the UFO's shields to fight. The Getter is unable to do anything to him, losing an arm and its giant axe. But finally, using the last of their determination, the Getter radiation turns the Shin Getter into the God Getter, which is Devilman-like and pretty awesome. Uh, and they can take out the Goru with, with a well-placed fist through the stomach. It's a tomahawk, not an axe! That's an important distinction. The name of it is clearly an axe because that is not what a tomahawk looks like. Yes, but they yelled, get a tomahawk. Yes, the Lancer tomahawk, but it's not a tomahawk. Okay. So, this may have sounded like a lot of plot for four episodes, but when you end up watching the show, nothing really happens. Well, stuff happens, but does it? If you're confused... It's because I was confused, and I had to watch this several times to write that description down. <laughs> the best way to enjoy this OVA is to watch it once and not really think about it too hard. Don't think, yeah, don't, you can't think about it too hard, because I can describe this plot much more simply. It's your typical um, battle manga style um, power level escalation, where you get a new thing, 
And then the, the baddies come along and you can't use the thing you had before, so you have to get a new thing. <laughs> and so on, until you get to the end. Surely you think about it in ways that are related to the plot. Like, the characters. You mean the <laughs> archetypes? Yeah, this was the thing, is normally we go into talk about the characters and we like like focus on our protagonist who would be Go here, and we would like go in deep and be like, what motivates them? Like, how do they act? And it's like... Well, we have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what is motivating him, because initially we're told that like the the Dino Emperor after him, because of his body and like I guess he's like able to be recruited and oh yeah, they never talk about that again. It's so, like it sort of gets implied at the end, I guess, when he's like talking about his body in relation to the Getter arrays, but it's really isn't. <laughs> Well, we also know that his mother was killed in a previous dinosaur in, uh, invasion. How do we know that, Denny? Uh, it is said in episode one by Hayato. Oh, is this is this is this, is this when he was talking to the other members of the Saitobi Labs about why he's hiring this about why he wants uh, this guy? No, no, it was after the at go, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he says it at go in the fighting ring. It's like, uh, who are you? What do you want from me? You're a go. Your mother was killed in a previous invasion of the dinosaur empire. I can, if you survive this, I can use you. Sorry, you're absolutely right. That is what happened. <laughs> but really, Go in this isn't a character. He's he's a get a robo archetype. He is the hot blooded protagonist with the power of belief, yeah. uh, who likes fighting, and that's essentially all Go is. Yeah, it's not like we really know much about any of the other pilots. Like no. Hayato is around to, like, oversee the modern incarnation of the for want of a better term, Getter Project. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure the fandom have terms for all of this, but like I saw several incons- some several inconsistencies in the way different people refer to things, so I made up my own. <laughs> Hayato is the second classical Getter Robo trope. He's the calm and collected one, though he also really isn't. In his first appearance in the original Getter Robo manga, he's leading a group of school students to rebel against society and the police, uh, and he literally rips some guy's face off. But he's the calm and collected one in this one. He's the he's pilot number two. I want that story. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. get the Getter fandom wikia like explicitly calls him a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> And like, like, who do we want to talk about? Show and um, Guy. Uh, Show. I think she's the only canonical female Getter pilot. There are other female pilots, even in this OVA, what a shame. but she's the only Getter female pilot that I think I'm aware of. She's the Lady Oscar archetype. Yeah, that's a very apt way to describe it. She's the she's the Hayato of this series. As Ian said in the beginning, we have the original team: Ryoma, Hayato, and Musashi. They're one, two, and three. This time we have Go, Show, and Guy. They're basically the exact same character. We have the hot blooded one, we have the calm and collected one, and as sad as it kind of is to say, we have the fat, fat one that's the that's supposed to form the heart of the team, but Guy doesn't really get any screen time whatsoever to be the heart of the team. Well, he's more of like the muscle in this. Yeah. He's he's like, yeah, I, I have the um the hard, like tornado version, and I'm all about like Beating them up physically, which, well, they're they're they've they've definitely more competent because they've already been working as a team. When yes. at the start of the second episode, Go is just like, eh, it's too hard timing the or the uh, combination of the mech. So I'm just gonna ram yep. in an extraordinarily unsubtle penetration metaphor. <laughs> you know, that's kind of another classic like trope of these kinds of show where we have the. Pilots who've already been training for like a long time, and then you get the newcomer and you make him the leader because he has the special. In fact, his show really acts like the leader for most of episode two. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she should be, really. I know this isn't really related, but one of my favorite things about the, uh, Get a Robo is so the third one, we have Musashi in the original team, then we get uh, Benke in the second team, and then we get. Uh, then we literally, for one OVA, I think we literally combined them into Musashi Bo Benke. <laughs> and, if, and, and if you're a celebrity looking for a strange name for your child, <laughs> <laughs> Musashi Bo Benke. It's mm. using two famous um, Japanese folklore characters. Yeah. I mean, they're all big and fat, all three of them. And they like to eat a lot, 
They're slightly perverted, and they act as the muscle of the team. Well, I was never perverted. No, no, I, but I feel like that's mostly because he didn't have the time to be. Yeah, I guess I was going to say, he also avoided most fat stereotypes right until the end of episode four. He's suddenly like, oh man, I'm really hungry now. And that's basically everything we know about our main characters. And the, oh, there's really only one other set of characters that's worth talking about, which is Jack and Mary King. Which is the it, villain. Uh, <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're Americans. That doesn't mean they're the villain. <laughs> oh, man, that's not who I meant, but yes. So they're the pilot of the American mech, Texas Mac, and they're massive stereotypes. So and that's basically it. I think me and Freya both have like different opinions about the stereotypical foreigner accent that they have, which is that I really like it and Freya really doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I used to like it about eight years ago. Yeah, I mean, it, it is overdone, but it's just like, yep, yeah, they're foreign. You can. Uh, that's all I need to know. You know what? You know what is funny though. Actual Americans just speaking Japanese with their normal accent. That's funny. Yeah, there was a really good video going around uh, Twitter slash TikTok about that. And, I mean, I used to do that bit for us yes. anyway. Yes. Um, one of the things I like, there's a few things I like about them. And it, it's just, aside from the fact of just how, like, stupidly American they are. Like, they come in on their, their, their robot has a horse. A giant robot horse. A giant robot horse that can fly, which is perfectly okay with me, but it is not clear how the horse is piloted, because both Jack and Mary are inside the main Texas Mac. I'm not sure if it is a robot, you know. I'm pretty sure it's a robot. Well, it's not a real horse. (laughs) What about hair? It's a wig. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, because Jack Jack is piloting the main mech, and Mary is piloting the hat of the mech, which is also the shield. Yes, because of course the uh, the mech is just a cowboy. Like he looks, he looks straight out of G Gundam, where every where we got uh, the tequila Gundam <laughs> and all of the, the windmill Gundam, all of those classics. But it's just like the the first like scene, the, the scene when he goes off to to um, rescue the president, like he's he, um, mm-hmm. is basically a Marlboro ad. <laughs> Uh, yeah. which is kind of hilarious. Also, Get a Robot implies that under every American embassy, there's a massive coffin with a gigantic robot sniper rifle inside. That coffin appears twice, and both times it has a giant sniper rifle in it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we built 172 giant sniper rifles. That In episode two, we just have one shot where... Texas Mac is standing there with his giant sniper rifle, the White House in the background, one explosion on the right and the American flag flying on the left. And if that's not the perfect pastiche of what this, what Texas Mac wants to be, I don't know what is. You know, my favorite thing about them is what? that they're treated like a complete joke and are kind of useless. <laughs> It's also not clear to me if they're just brother and sister or like husband and wife or what. They're brother and sister. Is that mentioned? Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. Okay. We haven't talked very much about the dinosaur emperor. How do we feel about our villain? (laughs) Man, how many times has the dinosaurs uh, evolving into humanoids and then coming back to try to get the earth back happened now? It can't just because be the Mario movie and Doctor Who. It must have happened more times than that. Yeah, I, I was I was going to say we did just watch the the live action Super Mario Brothers movie relatively yeah. recently, and I did immediately go to the Silurians as well. Yeah, it come it comes a lot when you have these sorts of theories of Agartha is just that anything can survive. There's yeah. usually there's usually dinosaurs at that mm. point. But the interesting thing is that they have been forced off the Earth, not by like humans or anything, but by radiation. Yes. Sentient radiation. The fourth episode implies that the dinosaurs and humans were actually in a contest to see who was worthy for the um, the sentient radiation. Essentially, like 10,000 years ago or so, or longer, the Geta race first bombarded the Earth and dinosaurs melted because of it. They just couldn't endure it, so they had to go underground. But Apes were able to like adapt to get a race, so they were chosen. It's often said as they were chosen by the get a race. And well, this four episode OVA doesn't really go into the nature of get a race in detail. Like the actual manga that spends a great time exploring like humanity evolution and get a race as kind of this energy of humanity that carries them forward. It's basically, I mean, if you've ever watched Gurren Lagan and are aware of the spiral energy. 
get a razor basically that. I feel like Gurren again uh, dipped more with it. <laughs> That's only because this is a four episode of EA Freya. I mean, but it doesn't sound like Get a Robo did. Yeah. Whatever. So, so, so what? Do, so, what do we have with no about the Get a Race from this OVA? It to make the dinosaurs go underground. It can melt them. <laughs> uh, they're very dangerous because lots of people don't want you to research them. They're sentient. Yes. And like it seems to be powered by your inner sense of self determination. Mm-hmm. And they have forgiven humanity. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's that's the stupidest line is get a raisin might just have forgiven us for now. The Emperor Gore has so much self determination. Yeah, but he's a filthy, filthy dinosaur. Well, by the by the time he becomes I forget what they call him, let's just say Mecha Gore uh, yeah. at the end. Like he's now immune to that sort of radiation, or except he is until the, it begets the god getter. Yeah. Which to be fair is really freaking awesome as a visual. It's Essentially, the Getter Robo uh, turns into a being of pure energy with the, the souls of the three pilots kind of trapped inside it. It's very, it's very like Lovecrafty in a way. <laughs> it's very Tetsuo, both the Iron Man and Akira. And then it reconstitutes itself into an admittedly not as cool form. I feel like the God Getter, the Getter Robo God, is a bit too chunky for my taste. But then he literally disembowels uh, Emperor Gor, which was kind of cool. Besides Gore, the dinosaurs don't really have much to offer character-wise. We have a ge- we have a general called Bat and a scientist whose name I can't remember. Galilee. 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 They're just there to be toadies and stand there and go, ah, Emperor Gore. Bat, Bat is there to give Noria one of a chance to be hammy as hell, and that's fine. Yeah. I do love Gore's stupid mouth design, which is like... It's one horizontal slit of like a giant row of teeth, and then there's four different vertical rows of teeth coming out yeah. of his, his ma- teeth. Out of the horizontal his teeth mouth. are like zippers, <laughs> essentially. It's, it looks really cool. And then there's his two extra faces. I, I I actually like most of the designs in this show. I liked the jellyfish. Mm-hmm. I love. That's my favorite mech in this. Yes, my favorite mech in this is an enormous jar of water with a jellyfish in it and a dinosaur head on top. I'm not surprised in the slightest. <laughs> Whereas I'm going for a basic Coke uh, getter, Shin Getter 1. I just love its iconic design. To, 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 to take it a sort of a way, um, I feel, uh, from like the sort of characters into more just like the mech, sh- the mech genre as a whole, like this is sort of. The, like it's very almost sort of nostalgic watching this, even though I had never seen it before, because of just how often it's been referenced in other shows, and sort of how many things are there that are just genre tropes or things you can take for granted. Like we already mentioned the um, the shadow villain uh, on the side of the moon, basically, which big fan. Um, I mean, there's all the sort of classic poses that come like at the end of transformation sequences there's i'm sure there was an obara pose but i wasn't uh, obari pose uh i'm sure i'm sure there was at least one of them the anime generally takes a lot of like classic getter robo frames from the manga and just straight up imposes them into the anime the frame of the original getter with musashi piloting it and him ripping out his own heart is an iconic getter robo image which we also uh, saw in Gunbuster and Diebuster because yes. that was just referencing this in many other shows. Mm. And the guy next pose, of course, which originally happens when a Mechasaurus is emerging from the ocean and the Gumbu- and the Getter Robo is standing on its head. <laughs> oh. Just posing. Another favorite thing is just that when the villains die, they say the name of King Goru, uh, which you may remember when we watched uh, Samurai Flamenco. <laughs> And they all say King Torture at the end. And everyone finds that hilarious. It's no, it's a, it's a genre thing. I was expecting them to do a bit more with the colours, if I'm going to be honest. But the colours are all over the place. Like, I, I, I partly, this is maybe because Get a Robo sort of predates the sort of standardisation of these tropes, in particular tokusatsu. But, like, I was expecting Command Red and Cool Blue. And I guess Green is the Lancer um, in this case, which is fine. But we had those colors, but then their mechs were completely different colors. So, because we had what red, blue, and black mechs with green piloting the it's pink, not red. 
uh, pink, red, um, it sounds better for the purposes of this argument if I say red, because then I have to redo uh, she was the pink ranger and she is not the pink ranger. Oh, her, her, her costume is red, her mech is pink. Yeah, yeah. Hilariously, in the preceding OVA, we do actually follow uh, Armageddon. We do actually follow protagonist, hot blood protagonist, red, uh, cool headed second in command, blue, and the third one is yellow in that one. And this is one way to say is that the colors change again when we move from the Neo Getter to the Shin Getter, where we go to red, white, and yellow, uh, with white taking over for blue, I think, and yellow for green. I actually think the like the iconic. Uh... Green, uh, green, red, and white of the Shin Getter Robo works really well as a color scheme because it just makes the uh, the Shin Getter pop. Denny, that, Denny, that's just the color wheel. Red is opposite green, and then <laughs> no. white, and white goes with everything. <laughs> also, the the Italian flag. <laughs> it's also the Italian flag, but that's <laughs> irrelevant. I assume it's irrelevant. We don't actually know. But like I said, this was this was annoying because I was like, get your color coding together. <laughs> Pricks. <laughs> well, at least the villains are all earthy colors. Yeah, like, and they sort of really ugly blue color, particularly for um, king, uh, king slash emperor Goru. Yeah. So, as we said, Geta Robo was the, the originator of the combining robots trope. And the way it does that, it has three different base uh, base units that combine into three different forms. Getter 1, Getter 2, and Getter 3. Each member of the team has its own form, that th- of which they are the central pilot of, and that also represent them in bo- uh, both physically and emotionally, though it doesn't really shine through in, in this one as much, once again, because of the shortened uh, episode count. We have the main basic Getter 1, the iconic one with the wings and the tomahawk axe, That's uh, of which the central color is red, it's piloted by Go and is the hot-blooded one. We have Getter 2, which is usually the drill form, which is generally piloted by Hayato or Sho, the equivalent of the cool-headed one, and it tends to have drills for arms and also be the tallest of the three. And then finally we have Getter 3, which is the tank form, so to speak. It's much bulkier than the other two. Uh, sometimes it tre- uh, treads and is like used as the heavy hitter of the three. And I personally like all three of the forms. I think it's it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the original Gundam, where uh, the Gundam also had multiple forms that it could come out in. I was a little underwhelmed, um, if I'm going to be honest. Like, I was expecting a bulkier drill form, because the drill form was associated with um, show, and so it was a, a very lean design yeah. and I was like no I feel like the drill needs a bit of bulk to it whereas they made it more like a more like a spear I disagree uh, it works for her fencer theme also in one scene she doesn't have drills and actually has a sword so I don't know of course like part of the advantage of this um is the it like allows you to put like a really interesting tie-in toy because like Bandai is one of the people who was uh, funding this anime, as we mentioned at the start. Uh, they also uh, did the same thing for Mazinger, and like they have a policy for um, their animation tie-ins. They want them to look cool and strong and have some sort of motion or functionality. And in this case, the having the three toys that can combine, like it gives like an interesting tactile sensation. Um, I, I think I remember by like as a kid having similar ones for like the Power Rangers where you'd get all five Zords and they would glom together. I can only imagine how difficult it is to design one that transformed into all three. I suspect they probably only transformed into one of them but could be combined. I mean, Ian, you were very annoyed about them being unable to transform into more than three forms. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> this is ve- like this is very important to me is that there should be six forms. <laughs> You have three choices. Uh, they should be able to combine into six forms. So I, I did a bunch of disco- seeing how they combined, and there seems to be some consistency in how this happens across the getter uh, across the um, the getter franchise. But like, just to take the Shin Getter, like red can go on top of white, can go on top of yellow. White can go on top of yellow, can go on top of red, and y- yellow can go on top of white, can go on top of red. But like we know nothing about red being able to go uh, about say red being able to go on top of yellow being go- able to go on top of white, even though we know yellow can go on top of white, and well we don't know that red can go on top of yellow, but 
one would assume. <laughs> and I could argue that there is a good way to do this mathematically, which is if they only go in one way and then the top can go into the bottom, then that gives you three unique designs. But since there's, but since like two of the designs follow this pattern and then one is like the complete reverse, it really throws it off and it really sort of frustrated me. I was like, oh. they could also just like pad it out longer, right? It's like, well, the anime is getting a bit stale. We just introduced Getter 4 and Getter 5 and Getter 6, which are just new combinations of uh, existing, existing robots. I I really don't mind it. I think it's fine for each getter to have, uh, for each pilot to have their own dedicated form. Like I understand what you're saying from a marketing perspective, but if we did this, then eventually we just end up with so many. Like just think about it. We currently have we have five mainline getter robo manga. If each one of those had six forms, we'd be at at the at the absolute minimum thirty forms. But there probably be way more because there are multiple getters. Well, the thing is, once you introduce multiple getters into the same timeline and start letting them mix and match, then all bets are off. <laughs> I mean, that literally happens here because we have can the, the Shin. Well, to be fair, the Shin getter probably can combine with the Neo getter just due to different energy types. But the original getter may have been able to combine with the Shin getter. It's not really clear, or really something that's talked about at all. Anyway, it's a good thing that they didn't do that in this four OVAs because the plot is confusing enough as it is. Without, <laughs> and we already get three transformations um, into each of the getter one, two, and three in the final episode, plus the God getter. So for four different versions of the robot in one episode. Also, speaking of speaking of Shin Getter and Neo Getter, the title of the show is technically a lie because it's called Shin Getter versus Neo Getter Robo, but there is no versus, so to speak, uh, to speak of. Maybe the versus is in a thematic sense, not a they actually, they have a fight sense. And what thematic sense would that be? Because the only theme I can think of is the theme of staying with safe plasma energy versus risking it with risky Getter energy. Because uh, that's really the only opposing things the two mechs really have, their energy source. So, is this are these OVAs anti-nuclear disarmament? No, we can't use the Getter Robo because the public doesn't like it. Fair enough. Doesn't matter that we've constructed our show in the way that it's the only thing that can kill the um, genocidal uh, people who live in our in the Earth's crust. But you know. Yeah, it's very it's very much in this i this idea um, that I, I mean we meant, I mean it was the same thing in Gunbuster already that like the idea was that the humans are like the pests falling on the planet and that there's an ecological bent to the to the villains, but I find that like really harder to buy in this particular instance when they're like basically going to use pollution to have global warming. <laughs> Uh, and a nuclear power is going to save us from global warming, for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, well, maybe in the real world, maybe. I was gonna. Well, I was gonna say it's it's it sounds flippant in twenty twenty one, but I guess this did come out in like two thousand. It would have been done in the nineties when that was yeah. a much more defensible argument. <laughs> I mean, it was set in nineteen ninety six, as we learn in episode two. Yes, and also I'm talking about it from nukes, not nuclear power. Mm-hmm. And that's what the Getter uh, Rays are to me, they're nukes. Yeah, I mean, in the later uh, parts of, like, later on in the manga, we do learn that the Getter Rays and Ryoma essentially turn into Getter, the Getter Emperor, which is a planet-sized robot that goes around conquering the universe, and the aliens <laughs> send... Send, send themselves back in time to stop that from ever happening. I mean, this is kind of like where, where like my, my thinking that this is sort of like the, um, the Ghostbusters goes in. It's just like, well, we know what's best and fuck everybody else, right? Yeah, we, this small group of um, independent people, know what's best. Fuck everyone else. And, and now that we know about the Getter Emperor stuff, thank you, Danny. Now, like, <laughs> I, I'm now thinking I should have been rooting for the Dinosaur Emperor the whole time, in spite of what yeah. I said flippantly in the beginning. <laughs> anyway, shitty political readings aside. Tell us your shitty political readings about Getter Robo. Uh, I feel like we can make that recent meme about the Gundam shooting over somebody's head uh, apply to Getter Robo somehow. I really don't like yeah. that meme. <laughs> <laughs> I All right. liked it until everybody used it. Yeah.
I think we may have like dunked on like the the plot and the themes a little bit. Mm. So like maybe we should talk about like who actually made this stuff. I mean, we've mentioned Bandai Visual, but um, like maybe you could explain a bit more uh, about the the people who made this for you. Yeah. So the director, as we said, is Jun Kawagoe. And um, as Denny said, directed pretty much every Get a Robo thing from 1998 onwards. That's right, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, including the currently airing one, which people didn't like. But outside of that, um, I guess the most famous things would be stuff like Innocent Venus or some Cyborg 09 projects to get it back to old sci-fi. And Kotetsu Shinji, which I knew it's like Denny has talked about. I have watched that show, and it's basically just this. Okay. It's basically just get a robot with a different name. Yeah. How did we feel about the visuals? Like, the visuals, I think, are like, it's like the strongest point for me. Like I said, I found this sort of thing very hard to watch as like an entire work. But like, if you cut out just like four minutes at a time and gave it to me, I, I could be pretty happy uh, <laughs> watching the, that four minute clip. Yeah. I, I actually really like the visuals. I think it it looks very good at pretty much any moment. There's some use of repeated uh, animation at times, but it's very rare. It's mostly for like attack animations, I think. Like everything else, uh, such as the motion, looks very good most of the time. They also do the thing where occasionally to convey impact, they use very heavy out, uh, very thick outlines and a lot of speed lines to visualize that. And I really adore it when they do that. I also think the cinematography is actually quite good as well, because there were a whole bunch of shots where I was sitting there to myself and thinking, this looks really nice. Like, there's one shot in episode one where they're climbing up a bridge, the Mechasaurus is standing in the background and reaching towards them. Uh, there's that shot in episode two with, with uh, Texas Mac in front of the White House. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other, like, smaller shots, but I think the cinematography is actually really good in this. Though a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the best shots are just taken straight up from the manga because Ishikawa was an amazing artist. When I read through the Get a Robo uh, saga, I took like 60 screenshots uh, of various panels because there were just so many wonderful like two-page spreads and, and panels. I think the another thing they do is they have these like um, diagonal cut-ins of the character, uh, close-up on the characters. My favorite one of which is of Bat, who I just want to call Bato. When um, he's fighting uh, Shin Gedorobo? Yeah, I think he fights Shin. Uh, and they have the cut-in of him, and then he's, like, yelling something, and as he moves towards uh, the camera, where his face, like, pushes the out of the screen. That was fun. Yes, credit the animators. Shin Matsuo. The water was fine. <laughs> I've been trying, I like, I mean, we haven't talked about war in a long time because it's like, I, I'm trying, I'm definitely trying not to talk about it because I felt like it was like an in-joke to talk about the war. <laughs> <laughs> um, those sort of like cut-ins are kind of like a mecha staple. Like, yeah, you see this a lot when like people in different mechs are communicating with one another and it's just the three faces online. And it's like, <laughs> it's really good in like a Gundam when like you've got one army and they're clearly talking to the other one. And it's just like, how do they have this communication? communication uh, <laughs> like they're just all talking on, on like an open channel <laughs> that's a good point everyone in this seems to be talking on an open channel because like they keep saying things mostly to themselves and then somebody else will respond to it <laughs> yeah it's one of my favorite uh, favorite genre trope yeah there's there's a, like a lot of like really strong limited uh, animation in this in like sort of canada-esque stuff i kind of wish that more of the uh, more of the um, the sequences on Sakagaboru were um, credited. credited. There were unfortunately there's only three of them, and I am not capable of you know, of being the person to fix that. Yeah, it's solid visually, I guess. If you like mecha action, I mean, there's no denying that the show is essentially just a giant four episode fight scene with occasional yeah. downtime to let you calm down before the next big fight scene. Kind of exhausting at times. It is exhausting. Hmm. And in the in the sort of way you get a bit checked out if you're not like really into it. I mean, I think this has a lot to do for once with the fact that we're watching this all at once rather than week by week, if we, or or every few months because this came out uh, no, across no. several months. Because I was getting checked out within just one episode. Yes, but that's we because you'd already it. watched multiple episodes. No, no, no. Before. The that's first, I mean. the first episode. It happened for the first episode. The first time I checked out. 
Well, that's on you then. And no, I it's mean, it, I blame I, bl- I blame the I blame the writing um, for that. <laughs> but I've already blamed the writing. <laughs> look, look. Let me let me just let me just put my cards on the table. This is poorly written. Maybe in the course of a manga, this is fine. But like, you can't just pl- compress everything and get a good result. Unless you really know what you're doing. Yet, that is kind of what this is. Shin Geta Robo versus Neo Geta Robo is a distillation. It's the absolute baseline of everything Geta Robo stands for and uh, explores. It has all of... But, it has everything any other Geta Robo TV show has. It has... But Denny... Well, well, d- 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 and here's the thing, Denny. You have seen at least one of the Geta Robos before, or read Geta Robo before. Neither me nor Freya had. So we came in this, and it's just like, hey... You want to buy some crack? It's like, no, I've never had crack before. Well, you're having crack. <laughs> my argument is that my argument would actually be that this is a good introduction. I cannot possibly, I cannot possibly understand how that would work. Let me finish. I think this is a good introduction because this basically tells you what you're getting if you watch a lot of Get a Robo. If you didn't enjoy this, you, I think you're unlikely to enjoy other Get a Robo stuff. If you thought this was amazing, then you're quite likely to enjoy other Get a Robo. I think this is a distillation of everything Get a Robo stands for and is about. But Danny, what if you enjoyed the action scenes and then were really annoyed by all of the shit that you feel like you were supposed to know about going into it but didn't? And that made the show worse. You're probably still going to feel that way about the other shows. Because the other shows are just an extended version of this. Why would you feel worse? Because you get stuff from all the things that you feel like you were supposed to know about going into this. Surely this is not a good starting point. This is not, this is not a good starting point. I feel like the show tells you everything you need to know about the self-contained OVA. If you watch it, as a, there's a dinosaur empire. There was a previous team. There's a new team. Oh, I agree. That's I, all I, you got, really I got. I got. I got. I got that. Yeah, that's all you really need to know about this. I know we haven't mentioned him, but why are you supposed to give a shit about Ryoma in the third episode then? From the like ten seconds in the, in the opening two minutes, like he was a member of the original team. Fine, muscle tough, but he appears in the third episode, and he's like, he gets like a two, like a minute at the beginning of just him looking at Musashi's yeah. grave, and and that's fine. He gets the most grateful moment of anyone. <laughs> But then, and then, and then, his next appearance is him um, just like saving the day when they're in front of the Shin Getter Robo, and General Bato is there with his goons. Um, and it's just like, well, I'm glad all the people who know who Ryoma is are happy. And I guess in episode four, we do learn that he like is a nice guy because he like saves the kids and stuff. I think this. I think this once again it has more to do with the anime trying to hit to do both things at once to try to tell its own self-contained story, but also heavily, uh, also like pander to existing Get a Robo fans. But I personally feel like you don't need to to watch because this was the first Get a Robo I watched. Yeah, sure, you don't need it, but it makes the show worse to watch, or it did for me. Like, well, this is yeah, this is what like I think both me and Fair are saying is that. You got it, and you're like, fuck it, I don't need to know this. And me and Freya watch this, and we're like, this show isn't for us. The show has just communicated to us that this show is not for us. Yeah, that's fine. And it's not that I don't like giant robots. Like, I like giant robots. But, now, but, but like, it's just kind of served me in the whole uh, thing. And it's like, maybe if I was watching the original Get Robo series week by week, and it was just like, nothing was happening. Just like how in Cutie Honey, nothing happened. <laughs> you, you I just, mean, that you was just, a 50-episode series. Yeah, so but, you just, but, but, but Cutie Honey, you just cut and paste the plot, and it's like, the fun is like Scooby-Doo. You're, it's like, you're, you're like paying attention to like the minutia. Whereas in this, it's, it's, it's highly concentrated. And so, like, you're going to get drunk quickly. And if you came in expecting to get drunk, you're happy because you're like, yeah, this is this is vodka. I like vodka. And if you got in, it's like, well, I ask for a white wine spritzer. <laughs> bad metaphors, everywhere, bad similes, everyone. But I think if there's one thing that we can all agree on, it's not the writing, it's the music. Uh... Or at least the opening. But, like, Freya, tell us a bit about the composer and stuff first. Well, the composer is uh, Kato Nobuta, who you would know from 
other Get a Robo project, Mazen Kaiser. Uh, some arrangement on Do Me. Honestly, most of the music isn't really worth talking about. There's one piece that sounds like generic fantasy music, and then there's variations of the opening theme that uh, that are used throughout. Like it's, I mean, it's a standard thing that you see across animation. If you watch, I don't know, let's say Family Guy, they'll rearrange the Family Guy theme. You're watching The Simpsons, they'll rearrange the Simpsons theme. It, it it's standard. You, you but like, I feel like they use it too much. I, I, yeah, I think I think having it having the opening play both at the end of episode three and episode four was a mistake. That's also true. Mm. Yeah, whereas like when they cut it right in the the perfect place in episode one, that was that was well done. It, it does make the opening a little bit confusing for the first episode, but it's the <laughs> right place to put it. So, the opening. This is actually how I discovered this show. I don't remember how exactly I came across it, but through some sheer coincidence, I came across the opening for this show, Storm, by Jam Project, a band I already really liked, and I thought it was amazing. I love it as a song. And then I said, you know what? I love this opening so much, I'll watch the anime. Jam Project, of course, famous, uh, stands for Japan Animation Song Makers. They've been around since 2000. They're really famous. They've made dozens of openings for anime, video games, and tokusatsu. You know who they are if you've watched anime. You might not know, you, you might not know their name, but you definitely have felt the, the you felt the work of Masaki Endo and Yoshiki Fuki, Fuku, uh, Yoshiki Fukuyama and all the rest Hironobu of them. Hironobu Kagayama. Uh, Ichiri Mizuki. Actually, wasn't he only in ones? <laughs> uh, doesn't matter. matter. Doesn't matter. They've done. You've heard their voices before. Yeah, uh, whether that's in I don't know, fucking um, One Punch Man or Cardfight Vanguard, Yu-Gi-Oh GX, uh, <laughs> Sergeant Frog. Even you've heard it. I, I think they are my favorite band for uh, for anime openings. Period. If you remember, if you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, we had we did an episode on Buso Rankin a while ago, and that was uh, well, it wasn't the Jam Project song. It did feature the members of Jam Project, and we really like that song. Well, me and Ian really did. So I'll give a I'll, I'll give a brief description. It's got like a weird sort of like um, traditional sort of like Japanese singing, like not quite like the Yamato one, not quite Anchor, but you you know the sort of like si- it's like a very like grandiose sing songy um quality to it and it's just sort of like telling you a little story the about the the dino empire breaking through and then as they approach the city everyone's running away but no our hero go is running towards the danger and then you just get the massive swell when they're all um entering the the getter robos they, they enter like elevator lifts. They sit in them and then they shoot up in the air. And and, and then oh. it's ju- and then it's just on like high energy while they fight, and it just doesn't quit until the until the end, uh, when they've defeated it. It's it made it in, it made it made it into our top thirty anime openings. I don't remember where we put it. It was ranked reasonably highly. No, it wasn't. It was like twenty four or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we know because of who that is, Freya, don't we? Wasn't just me who rang it low. <laughs> it's 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 ed- it's edited very well. One of my favorite things about uh, the opening is the editing because I've seen few other opening where the actual lyrics describe so perfectly what is happening on screen when they whatever they are singing about is happening on screen and that doesn't really happen all that often. Yeah, that was the yeah. thing. That was the thing when we were discussing it is like we were watching this and we're like, it's good. We really like it. But what's special about it? And then I don't remember who who pointed us to the lyrics, whether it was it me was or Danny. Danny. It was probably Denny. And then we watched it again. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> uh, the, of course, Jam Project did both of the endings for this. But, like, I just... Jam Project has done essentially all the openings and most of the endings for all the recent Get a Robo things as well. And the most recent Get a Robo arc has just featured new arrangements of of all of their classic songs, like the Storm, Stormbringer, Dragon, Rising, and a bunch of other things. I love it. Yeah. The ending. The ending is called Rising, as Ian said, by Jam Project. It's still a great song, though. I don't love it quite as much as I do Storm. And visually, it's mostly just a bunch of silhouettes on colored screens standing there. 
Yeah, you get a little bit more in the ending, the visuals for the fourth ending, because it's all the prologue stuff. Like, you see, like, Sho doing Kendo, and yeah. Guy eating a metric fuck ton of ramen. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, little vignettes like that, which is nice. I, I, I do like, I, I like, uh, 80s style, um, here's what they did after the movie. <laughs> the music that was actually playing in the fourth episode was apparently the Texas Max theme. Who guessed? So, like, we like, I mean, we've talked about like something we like, but I will say one thing I didn't like, or like, that I thought was a missed opportunity, which is in the first episode, when he's there uh, beating the shit out of the dinosaur in the like outside the ring. He's got the bell and the hammer in his hand. And I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. You haven't heard what I'm going to say yet. Well, you were going to say that it never dings. It never dings. <laughs> He, I know. He like if it were me, like uh, that, I would have had the bell uh, on top of the guy's head, and I would be dinging it every time I hit it. It was such a missed opportunity. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually disappointed because I was like, they're gonna, they're <laughs> gonna do it, they're gonna do it, and they never did it. There is some odd sound effects in this. There's hmm. the Dalek laser sound. <laughs> it's also the. <laughs> The same noise that uh, Dark Souls uses for its lifts was the noise that they used for pulling the chain of the gun for it's buried under the White House lawn. I I I I think a lot of the this, the sound effects just didn't work nearly as well as they should have done. But that's okay though. We can't get everything or even most things. <laughs> I think the opening was fine. Okay. <laughs> And I'm shaking my head at you, even though you can't see it. And you're totally justified to have your own opinion. That's to get you back for doing that in the last episode. About <laughs> the Army. And so we need, and so we have to come down to give our ratings. And because I'm saying this, and because Denny goes last, <laughs> Freya, oh, how shit. many, how many getter transformations should the show get out of five? Two. Uh, and I assume you're not going to want to say anything more than that. <laughs> It didn't make me interested to get a robo, which was the selling point. And I don't think it really stood it up on its own to do anything. Plenty of, plenty of okay stuff about it, though. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same way. I think there's like a lot of good stuff in here, but this show isn't good. So for me, it has to fall in the sort of two, two and a half range. It's less than the sum of its combining getters. That's... That, that's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. They, they've they've made these little like great robots, and then they've combined it, and I'm disappointed. <laughs> uh, so like two, ten, two and a half, because, like I say, the consistent escalation is the death of any kind of tension for me. Like this show doesn't have tension. Like there's always something new that happens like just when you think you're safe which usually sounds like it would be like a good thing but it's like no i want like to to rip off hitchhawk i want there to be a bomb under <laughs> saotome labs and i wanted to be there the entire time they're talking we didn't even mention professor saotome in the entire episode he didn't make that much of an impression mm. and yeah mostly we're just annoyed by his guitar i didn't my actually i i got over that although i do hate that trope does he also wear gator? Yeah, yes. but only oh, okay. but only because I hate Professor Shikishima yes. so much more. <laughs> I, I, I hate that guy. So I think we'll say two and a half. It's um, it's right down the middle. Like all the stuff I like about it is ruined by the rain. And so now we turn to Denny for the positive review. <laughs> As for me, I don't think I've made any secret about how much I love this show. It was my introduction to Get a Robo. It's made me a fan of the franchise. That's why you're giving it a 6 out of 10. No. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's caused me to read the entire manga uh, and watch all of the more recent OVA. I haven't gone back to watch all of the all of the old 70s stuff, mostly because that's very different from the manga and the more recent OVAs. But what I love about this OVA is that it knows exactly what it is. It is unabashedly stupid. And in a way that I really enjoy, I can understand why some people don't like it. But for me, when I first watched it, I turned my brain off. I watched the pretty colors and the spectacle and the cool fights and the cool animation and the cool robots. And I was engrossed. I really liked the show. And I'm going to give it a four out of five because it's, it's good. I, I really like it. But of course, it's by no means perfect. 
specifically the issue of it dragging on and the lack of tension come to mind. But at, at the same time, sometimes I don't need any tension in my shows because I, of course, I know that the Getter team is always going to win. But it is just such an enjoyable show for me to watch. Like I, I, I need. I, I'm okay with them always winning, but like sure, someone needs to get maimed. <laughs> and they do in the manga. The robots get maimed. What okay. you should do if you want to get to get a robot is just really read the manga. You watch Giant Robo instead. Okay. Do we have any trivia to uh, leave this off with? Yes, I do have one piece of trivia. It has nothing to do with the anime, but. I want everyone to know that Gona Guy starred in the second Toxic Avenger live action movie. <laughs> Why? Because I can. What film experience does Gona Guy have? <laughs> he was in Toxic Avenger, Ian. I forgot that he was still alive, to be honest. I mean, he's still making shit, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. People need to talk more about Gona Guy. We need people to like write about him. Yeah, yeah there's so little written about him. And as I said, he's so incredibly prolific. It's because he sucks. No. Like, he, he, so you could argue that he created, like, he was part of the creation of the super robot, but he created, this, he pioneered the super robot genre, the magical gun genre. I really want. All those think pieces about how Violence Jack since secretly influenced everything. I mean, Violence Jack is terrible, but it probably influenced a bunch of stuff. Like Fist of the North Star. Fist of the North Star is definitely influenced by Violence Jack. Here's, a, here's my take. Like, if Tezuka is like the godfather of, <laughs> of manga, then like Go- Gonagai is like the uncle that like, yeah. <laughs> that like lets you watch cartoons when he's over to stay with you. Like those violent cartoons you're not supposed to watch. Exactly. Cool. Yeah, he lets you watch the stuff with too much breast and too much blood. That's a good way of describing Gonagai's work. Too much breast and too much blood, but honestly, there wasn't any of that in here, really. So my piece of trivia is that Yu Asakawa, who did the voice of Shotachi Bana, that was the female pilot, uh, was the one who provided voice samples for Vocaloid's uh, Megurine Luka. The third best Vocaloid. <laughs> uh, no, that's not true. No comment. <laughs> that's not true. Also, so also, we should probably mention this. Both Shin and Neo mean you. So we have... Yes. So it, so we have the, this day is... New Getter Robo versus New Getter Robo. <laughs> Freya, what are we watching next time? Next time, we will be watching Dokusei. Oh. Something I've never heard of, so that'll be interesting. So we can look forward to that. We are the Anime Research Group, a bi-weekly podcast coming out every Thursday, more or less. If you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us at Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye. I had something. I was gonna say something funny, but then I then I forgot what I was gonna say. Well, that's staying in. <laughs>